The practice of science has shaped the modern era. But how are discoveries made? And how does science progress? Three British scientists, world leaders in their fields, have changed our understanding of our universe, our planet, and ourselves. A physicist whose mysterious radio signals from space rewrote astronomy. She actually recognized that there was something happening. I suspect that perhaps only one in a hundred people would have spotted it. A chemist whose radical theory about our planet divides the scientific world. He's one of the greatest thinkers of the current age and destined to go down in history. And a biologist who discovered the secret of life in a sea urchin. Your fundamental discoveries have profoundly increased our understanding of how the cell cycle is controlled. Their stories tell us about the nature of scientific inquiry in the modern world, about how scientific breakthroughs are made, and about the workings of the scientific brain. Scientists should never claim that something is absolutely true. You should never claim perfect or total or 100% because you never, ever get there. If we assume we've arrived, we stop searching. And we stop developing. In 1967, a PhD student called Jocelyn Bell noticed something that shouldn't happen. Strange, regular flashes of energy emanating from deep space. She had discovered completely new types of stars that came to be known as pulsars. Now, you were responsible for spotting the very first pulsar, personally, I think. Jocelyn Bell's discovery fundamentally changed science's understanding of the universe. All of a sudden, people went from thinking about the universe being relatively dull and boring to suddenly the universe is full of these things flickering and flashing around. It was really amazing and very exciting. The girl who started all the fuss about the pulsars, Jocelyn Bell, was a research student at Cambridge. Pulsars provided the first evidence that Einstein's theory of gravity was right and resulted in the winning of a Nobel Prize. But according to their finder, their discovery tells us about the nature of science itself. Science always doesn't go forward. It's a bit like doing a Rubik's Cube. You sometimes have to make more of a mess with a Rubik's Cube before you can get it to go right. You build up this picture of what there is and you believe it to be true and you work with this picture and you refine it. But sometimes you have to abandon the picture. Sometimes you, you discover that the picture you thought you had, that everybody thought we had, actually turns out to be wrong. Way back in the Middle Ages, they thought that planets went round the sun in circles, perfect circles. They had to be perfect, they were heavenly bodies. And then they got better telescopes, better data, and they recognised that the planets weren't where they expected them to be. They weren't in the right place. But they were reluctant to relinquish the circles, so they invented epicycles, little circles on the rim of the big circle, like a roundabout of roundabouts. And they could explain what they observed like that. And then they got better telescopes and better data and found that they had to add more epicycles and it got messier and messier and messier. And then one of the key astronomers of the time, Johannes Kepler, said, maybe it's not circles or circles plus epicycles or circles plus epicycles with epicycles on them. Maybe it's slightly squashed circles, ellipses. And that cleared the air wonderfully. And suddenly it was clear and simple again. Constant questioning of assumptions and probing of ideas has defined Professor Belle Burnell's career. It is this philosophy that has resulted in her becoming one of the world's leading scientists. 
an astrophysicist who believes that her discipline reveals the essence of who we are. The kind of chemical elements that you find inside the human body, hydrogen and oxygen in the water, carbon in our tissue and calcium in our bones, iron in our bloodstream, they've come basically from the earth because that's where the plants got them from. The earth and the sun, because they formed at much the same time, got these chemical elements from previous exploding stars. The material goes through a stellar cycle, explodes, gets incorporated in the sun and the earth and into us. And when we die, those atoms will get returned to the earth. We are intimately and ultimately children of the stars. We are made of star stuff. So when we look at the night sky, we are seeing the kind of environment that we came from, that the atoms of which we are made came from, the roots of our being, if you like. And that's why I find astronomy so important and so fascinating. Jocelyn, how did you first become interested in the stars? Oh, I've been interested as long as I could remember, Sue. So. Dad had a subscription to the Linen Hall Library in Belfast and brought home all sorts of books. But the ones that really caught my attention were two or three books about astronomy. Fred Hoyer's Frontiers of Astronomy and a book by Dennis Sharma. Astronomical distances have the air of a conjuring trick. The vastness of cosmic dimensions fills us with astonishment. Yet like a conjuring trick, it all looks very obvious when we see how it is done. It was reading those books that made me realize what an exciting and interesting subject astronomy was. I find it fascinating that with a limited number of snapshots or observations, of the sky, we can deduce so much, not just the evolution of stars and galaxies, but actually the evolution of the whole universe, how it began and how it will end. Nowhere else in science can you get this big picture. It's unique to astronomy. Today, a new moon is in the sky, a 23-inch metal sphere placed in orbit by a Russian rocket. The launch of the Sputnik satellite was a real shock in Britain and in the USA because both Britain and the US believed they were in advance of the Soviets technically. And then the Soviets go and launch a satellite, which we couldn't do. You are hearing the actual signals transmitted by the Earth-circling satellite, one of the great scientific feats of the age. So clearly there was some hard thought and head scratching and as a consequence, there was suddenly a great emphasis on science. Science was very well regarded and any kids who could do science were encouraged to go and do science. And I was part of that movement. My father would get us up to see Sputniks go by and he would explain to us the difference between a satellite and, say, a shooting star. Um, we named one of our cats after one of the satellites, in fact, Vostok. So it was very much embedded in the family. <laughs> With the space race, science had acquired an air of glamour, inspiring a new generation of scientists. I went away to boarding school at age 13. The physics teacher that I had, Mr Tillett, was a super teacher. One of the things I remember him teaching us is that once you, you've got a grip on physics, you only need to learn relatively few facts, and then you can build on that. You can develop a long, long way from relatively few bits of information in the first place. And that economy appealed to me. I could well have had a physics teacher who took the view that girls couldn't do physics and what's the point of trying kind of thing. I'm not sure where I'd have gone then, what I'd have done, but uh, Mr. Tillett was quite the opposite. But at university, Bell encountered a less enlightened attitude. I 
went to Glasgow and I was the only woman doing physics. And every time I entered the lecture theatre, as was the tradition, the guys whistled, stamped, catcalled, banged their desks. And I had to learn not to blush, because if you blush, they do it more noisily. It also had an isolating effect. There was a, a them and me. I was rather on my own the whole time. Since then, Professor Bell Burnell has campaigned to encourage women into science, not for the benefit of women, but for the benefit of science. One of the things women bring to a research project, or indeed any project, is they come from a different place. They've got a different background. Science has been named, developed, interpreted by white males for decades. And women view the conventional wisdom from a slightly different angle. And that sometimes means they can clearly point to flaws in the logic, gaps in the argument. They can give a different perspective of what science is. For centuries, man has used his eyes to look at the stars. But now he's found a new method of observing the universe. The early 60s were very exciting times in astronomy, particularly radio astronomy. Radio astronomy was perhaps 10, 15 years old, coming into its prime, discovering things right, left and centre. It was all going on. It was fantastic. Cambridge University, where Jocelyn Bell had started her PhD, was leading the world in modern radio astronomy. It's almost as if astronomers and indeed physicists were in the position of Columbus at the time he discovered a new continent. This is the way we feel at the present time. There were a lot of big names around. I mean, there was Stephen Hawking and Dennis Sharma and Fred Hoyle and so on. So there were a lot of very, very brilliant people there. Jocelyn Bell had found her spiritual home. It was here that glamorous Russian satellites Mr. Tillett's inspirational teaching and Glasgow University's trial by ordeal would start to bear fruit. This is the Mallard Radio Astronomy Observatory, a branch of the Cavendish Laboratory of Cambridge University. And here we can see Dr. Tony Hewish, who will tell us more about it. We were looking far beyond optical telescopes. I mean, you felt very privileged, actually. I mean, it was like opening a new window on, onto the universe and you were the first people to, to have a look out through and, 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 and see what was there and to realise that you were probing back in time. I mean distance and time go, go together. The further off you can see something, the earlier in the history of the universe it actually happens to be. Here we were looking back in over the history of the universe in a sense and discovering things that you could only discover that, that way. One of the pioneers of radio astronomy is Martin Ryle. With optical telescopes, one is limited to a range of observation about here. With radio telescopes, one can, however, detect galaxies at greater distances. And with our new large radio telescope at Cambridge, we think we are being able to detect galaxies right up to this region uh, here.